We have pictured here the cost-effectiveness plane. Whenever we're talking about cost-effectiveness analysis or cost-utility analysis, we need to think about the results in terms of the four-quadrant cost-effectiveness plane, where the horizontal axis represents the delta E and where the vertical axis represents the delta C. So if the the X, if the spot marked X represents current standard of care, which might be representing do nothing, as we move along the horizontal axis to the right from the origin, that re represents options which are more effective. And as we move up the axis, that represents more cost. So you can imagine that we've got four quadrants here, and we name them the northwest quadrant, the northeast quadrant, the southeast quadrant, and the southwest quadrant. So in the northwest quadrant, we have the situation where something is less effective but costs more than the next best alternative or the standard of care. And in that case, if it costs more and it's worse, then we should not take that new option into practice. And that's easy. That's an easy decision rule. Um, we actually reject those types of options in healthcare. When we have the situation of the southeast quadrant, where something is actually more effective and costs less, that's also a very easy decision rule. When we find alternatives compared to standard of care that are more effective and cost less, we should take them up into practice in order to release more resources back into the system and get more efficacy. However, the more common situation is the northeast quadrant or even the southwest quadrant, where in the northeast quadrant we have drugs or devices or procedures or programs which are more effective but they come at an incremental cost. And we have to decide whether or not that incremental cost is worth it. Alternatively, in the southwest quadrant, this is a very compelling quadrant where we might have something that is a little bit less effective but costs a lot less and perhaps that's worth it too. We have a number of things in healthcare which we actually do take up into practice which are a little bit less effective but cost a lot less and perhaps are more convenient. And because, again, they, resor they release resources back into the system, we may wish to take those up, things up into practice if we can use those released resources for something even more cost-effective. So then, coming back to the concept of cost-effectiveness, what is the magic number above which we say something is cost-effective and below which something is not cost-effective? So if we have an ICER, for example, and the ICER comes out at $50,000 per life year gained, is that a good deal? Or is that not such a good deal? Well, coming back to that cost-effectiveness plane, we need to think about this a little bit deeper. Is there a magic ICER above which we say no? Well, if we look at, at this quadrant, the same cost-effectiveness plane, and we've, we've got the four quadrants again, the red line here represents the willingness to pay, or the threshold ICER. We use those two terms interchangeably. The threshold ICER can represent the maximum willingness to pay of a society, for example. And even though we might not know in a society exactly what is the threshold ICER, willingness to pay, for new drugs or technologies, we can find some clues in research and from our history of decision making approximately where that threshold ICER lies. So that threshold ICER is the point above which an ICER calculated for a new option represents not such a great deal. So the added costs do not um, are not representative of a good value for money. And below that ICER if a new option comes in below that ICER, it represents generally good value for money. However, in reality, that line is not a crisp line. It's actually a, quite a gray area that oscillates. And in 
Canada and in Ontario, we often talk about, you know, an ICER of uh, six, 50 or $60,000 per quality adjusted life year just as a benchmark to get the discussion going. And if a new drug or technology or technique comes in with an ICER that's much higher than that, say for example $100,000 per quality, we may still consider that a relatively good deal. And it depends on other things that impact on decision making and weigh in on the decision. Because remember, ICERs do not capture all aspects of a decision. Remember what goes into an ICER, it's really delta C over delta E. So it's the costs and the benefits. Inherent in the costs are all the resource considerations, direct and indirect costs, short term and long term, whatever costs are induced by, by the options at hand. In the delta E are all of the effects that are measurable. However, delta E, neither delta C, includes things such as ethical considerations or considerations of equity where we may want to pay a higher price or may be willing to pay a higher price for very serious diseases or for very rare diseases or for situations where we just have no other alternative. We may be willing to pay a higher ICER. So that's why there is no one magical ICER. It's actually an oscillation or a gray area of a variety of different ICERs that depend on those other factors. But there is some maximal willingness to pay out there because presumably we are not in a society willing to pay exceedingly great costs for infinitesimally small qualities or benefits. And for that reason, we know there is some maximum out there, but we're just not sure how to define that because it depends on the situation at hand.